Rules are that any Cornell or uh, 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 student or group of students can apply. There's no requirement to be part of ECE, even. The uh, uh, what's due today is a two-page proposal plus a 60-second um, elevator pitch, video eleva elevator pitch. And uh, we have no idea how many we're going to get. It could be 10, it could be 100. I'm guessing it's going to be 10 or 20. They're going to fund one or two of them. The intellectual property is the usual. Actually, it's a little more liberal than usual. If everybody's an undergraduate on the team, the, the Cornell has no hold over it at all. If anybody is a PhD student, Cornell owns it, as usual. A master's student is, cons for this purpose, is considered not to be a paid graduate student. And so, master's students own their intellectual property. No, I'm not about the IP. Uh, I mean, they'll be graduating in May, right? So they don't have any time to develop the Well, that's a, that's a commercial, that's a, that's a practical constraint. If there's no time to develop it, then you, you, you're going to, I mean, part of this project is a budget that you have to say how you're going to spend. In principle, you could say, we're going to graduate in May and then stay for three months and develop it, and 5000 of that will be my salary. You could do that. <clears throat> Pardon me? Now, I don't know. That's unspecified. It might be OK. It might not be. It probably, it, it probably is not going to be OK to take the money and run. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I uh, uh, played around a little bit more with this uh, twin T notch filter. This this twin T notch is is tuned to 59 hertz. And I think what I showed you last time was that the pulse response is is less than overwhelming. That you you'd have a tendency. This has a tendency to ring very badly. And so I thought I'd show you what the, the sine wave response is, because I did not do that last time. And this is closely related to the, to the, to the Fourier response. The, the resistors are set here so that the Q is rather high, the notch is rather narrow. It's only a few hertz wide. That resistor is small, which drops the width of the notch. If that resistor were zero, the notch would be infinitely narrow, whatever that means. So when we, when we simulate this now with two sine wave sources, one is tu one tuned to the cutoff frequency, and the other one just below the cutoff frequency, when we put two voltage sources in series, of course, they sum. And we can ask what the input is. And the input looks like some sort of beat frequency. You sort of add and cancel and add and cancel. And there's only a few hertz apart. So they're, they're five hertz apart. So the, the width of this is going to be a few hertz, a few cycles. <clears throat> what comes out is a pure sine wave at 54 kilohertz, at 54 hertz. Implying that the 59 hertz signal has been completely filtered out, so we can go even closer than that. Let's let's edit that. Instead of 54 hertz, let's make it 57 hertz, 57 and a half, because that's what I happened to hit. Then you can see that there's a good good deal of beat frequency here between the two. But the 57.4 hertz input is almost pure at the output, even though it's only 2 hertz away from the resonant frequency of the system. <clears throat> the input, the, the amplitude of the input, 
is one volt, the amplitude of the filtered output is 300 millivolts peak to peak, so it is losing some amplitude. So, uh, it's losing one volt. It's, it's losing. It's losing. It's losing quite a bit, but it's but it's still it's pure it, in the sense that the 59 hertz has been completely filtered out. So that shows you that the the twin T is working as advertised. Even though the pulse response, the impulse response, the 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 short time response is not very good. So we saw last time when you put in a pulse like that, you tend to get something like this out. <clears throat> so you can ask yourself for a an ECG for an ECG that looks like like this is this more like a pulse or more like a half a sine wave you know or is it so is it going to be highly distorted by a notch filter and the answer is what do you think what do you think? It has lots of Fourier components that are high frequency because it is a single pulse, right? It's fairly sharp edges. How distorted is this going to be? Is this going to have a distortion which is more like this, in which case the waveform is going to look like that? Or is it going to be more like a half a sine wave and be filtered more like like that? What do you think? Well, you could try it, but there's going to be significant distortion on this. So Notch filters are good in that they suppress 60 hertz. They are bad in that if you make them very sharp, which ideally cuts out the 60 hertz, you will also distort the ECG that you're trying to, to recover. So <clears throat> I'm going to link up. I haven't done this yet. And I, I haven't figured out how to get MATLAB running yet on the iPad, or I would show you this. Uh, but, but the uh, um, I think it's going to be more effective to use a high-order low-pass filter than a than a notch filter. And I think what you're going to want to do for lab four is to, f is to use a fairly sharp cutoff low pass filter somewhere in the few dozen hertz region. I guess I would say that you probably ought to use a two-stage low-pass system. One is a low-precision low-pass <clears throat> analog, and then a high-precision, high, -precision, high uh, fast cutoff low-pass filter in in digital digital format. <clears throat> so there's going to be your amplifier going out to the electrodes. There's going to be a low-pass. A to D converter into MATLAB. So now we're in software, right? After this is software, here's hardware. And here you're going to do some sort of low pass or maybe band pass. And then do the signal detection stuff out here heart rate, whatever. Interestingly, I found a patent today that 
that quantifies how to go from a plethysmograph measurement to blood pressure. All right, so when you, you, you stick your finger in the, in, the, in the plethysmograph, you get a measure of the relative change in pressure at your fingertip, but it doesn't tell you anything about absolute pressure. However, if you combine that with ECG, then your ECG, your, your ECG waveform tells you when the pressure pulse started at the heart. Sometime later, you get a pressure wave at the finger. And the delay between these two gives you the propagation velocity of the pressure wave in the vessel. Interestingly, the propagation speed of the, of the wave in the vessel is proportional to blood pressure. And why is that? It's because if you pump the blood uh, pump the vessels up, they become more they're more inflated, they're stiffer, the vessels walls are stiffer and and, and right, and so the propagation speed is faster because you don't have the losses in the in the in the in the vessel. As you deflate it, the system becomes softer, softer, and the propagation velocity goes down. Within a given person, the relationship is quite exact. Between people, it's still pretty good, but. For lab four, if you were to combine the plethysmograph circuit, which you probably still have and have not taken apart, how many people have taken it apart? Well, all right, so half. So you could rebuild it in 20 minutes probably, but you could combine the plethysmograph and the, and the ECG that you're building and, and derive a blood pressure meter out of it. Yes? And the question is with regard to amplifying the signal that you get out of a filter. Uh -huh. So, like the signal here is 230 milliwatts, I suppose. If I want a stronger signal, so I can do two things. Either amplify it before sending it to the filter, or amplify it after it comes out of the filter. Will that make a difference? So the answer, so the question is, should you amplify before you go through a filter, or after you go through a filter? So if, they were, if both of the operators were perfectly linear and noise free, then it doesn't matter, right? Because, because they're both linear operators and so you can commute them and, it, and, and you get the same result. <clears throat> In the presence of significant noise, well, it depends on what the noise sources are. Quite often, the noise is gonna be dominated by physiological noise plus interference. 60 hertz, whatever. And in that case, again, it doesn't matter because you, you, if you amplify the noise along with the signal and then filter, amp, filter and then amplify the noise, it doesn't, still doesn't matter unless when you amplify the whole thing, the whole signal plus noise, it get, you get to the point where the noise clips. If the noise clips, if you, if you, if you amplify the signal enough that the system becomes nonlinear, then you should filter first, then amplify. <clears throat> if the dominant noise source is the amplifier itself, then you should amplify, then filter. Because you, because you don't want to have noise from two amplifiers mixed together, from the op amps mixed together. You want to get the signal as big as possible, as soon as possible, to go to put the small signal through as few op amps as possible. Generally, it's not going to matter because because the you're you're neither going to saturate the amplifier nor are you going to be dominated by instrumental noise mostly. Mostly you're going to be dominated by env environmental noise, which is linearly added to the signal. Uh, 
Yeah. I found some of uh, some isolation amplifiers, isolated amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So instead of having an isolated power supply, could we just use an isolation amplifier? You could use an isolation amplifier. Yes. So isolation amplifiers are are there, there are various schemes for 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 them. Some include an isolated power supply in them. And some require also require an isolated power supply, but but eliminate the need for the opto isolator. And there there are both variants available, and any one of those could be used. I broke it out into as many pieces as possible, kind of for for pedagogy, right? So you could see all the pieces. But yes, in real life, you would probably use an integrated isolation amplifier. Now, any questions about this lab? About so we have this we have this this isolated power source here, takes in five, puts out plus minus twelve or so, and you've probably found that this is a pain in the butt to get working. To use a technical term, and. A, there's there's various reasons for this. One is a close reading. Let me let me redraw this with plus twelve zero minus twelve. A close reading says that you have to have a fairly significant capacitance between these leads. And what it doesn't say, but which is true, is that there has to be a finite load on this system at all times for it to work. So I would put a resistor across here at some reasonable value, 2K, 1K ohm, something like that. Maybe, maybe 2K. There also, on the plus 5 and ground end, there has to be a fairly large decoupling capacitor for the system to be stable and to avoid reflecting noise out into the power supply. When you set this up, did it work? Or was it still noisy? Yes? Uh, the negative was stable at something around 12 volts, probably 11.25. .4. But the positive V is 17. 17 is still probably not a problem. But, but because when we were looking at the amplified outputs, so they were more in the Positive More in the negative region than in the positive region, probably because of this. So the if you if you use I don't know why I wasn't symmetric. Yeah. If you use plus seventeen and minus twelve. If you use plus seventeen and minus twelve, the the effectively the the ground point is shifted. But that's all. And why would we get if First part, why do we have an odd voltage? Isn't it supposed to be relatively? These are not regulated power supplies, so they're not they're not very precise. They are they're they're what you get. Oh, you might try loading the positive supply a little more and see if the voltage goes down. Anybody have trouble with excessive noise generated by the by the power supply? What frequency was the noise? Anybody measure that? It would look like high frequency crap coming out of there, right? Yeah, I, I saw it on like the uh, 2.5 microsecond scale. 2.5 microseconds, so that's like uh, uh, 400 kilohertz. Interestingly enough, the internal oscillator runs at 400 kilohertz. There is a there is a one-liner. Oh man, it's the it's the classic one-liner in the in the in the in the in the data sheet that says. So you have the sync pin up here, right? The sync. Sync pin. If you. If you ground this, it's turned off. If it's floating, it's turned on. 
there's a one line in there that says significant capacity of loading may change the oscillator frequency. What is significant capacity of loading? Um, one picofarad, ten picofarads, a hundred picofarads. <clears throat> the whiteboard is a capacitive load. Therefore, the careful student will cut that pin right the hell off the integrated circuit. Cut it off. Flush with the with the with the with the body of the integrated circuit to cut down the capacitance. That may get rid of the noise. Well, I played a little bit that pin. Uh, I connected it to the I mean to one pin of the uh, capacitor and the other pin was first in ground and then in supply and I mean, different things when you did that. So well, that's right, because any capacitive load you put on here to ground or VCC messes the oscillator up. This goes directly onto the oscillator. Even if you decouple it with the ground, what would happen if you decouple it with using a capacitor and the other thing is the ground? The more capacitor that you put on it, the worse it is. Oh. Right? It is capacitance sensitive. You want to minimize the capacitance, you want to cut this pin off completely. That may get rid of the noise. If what's happening is that the oscillator is being erratic because of the capacitance, that may get rid of it. Otherwise, I want to look at the waveform of the noise. <clears throat> In general, I haven't had too much trouble with these as long as I was careful with that pin. Now one circuit I built once upon a time used that pin to gate these things on and off. I put three of these, I put, took the 15 volters, put the two 15 volts in series to make 30 volts, and then put three of the integrated circuits in series to make a 100 volt output at 10 milliamps. And yes, it hurt you get clobbered with that. And then gated them all on and off in synchrony with the sync out input so I could make an isolated stimulus device for connecting to a biological prep or to a human. I didn't hook, hook it to a human. I was hooking it to a, 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 for a fish brain. And the, the, the uh, why? Well, you want to you want to fire action potentials in the in the fish spinal cord, and this did. The fish was anesthetized. No, but why 100 volts? Oh, because the impedance of the electrodes is quite high. I need to get a certain amount of current out, and the impedance of the electrodes is on the order of 10 mega ohms. So I need a lot of voltage to get a few milliamps out. And you put a little too much out through the electrode, and it blows the tip off the electrode uh, because it causes a steam explosion in the tip of the electrode. And then you curse and build an electro. But, um, but it was, I could gate this on in about 10, uh, on or off in about 10 microseconds. So it was quite impressively fast gated power supply in that, in that mode. Low noise. I've used these in audio amplifiers. I've used them in audio filters, field, uh, field audio amplifiers that were, po were powered off a 12 volt battery and had no problem with the noise. So, cut that pin off and see if it helps. How about the opto isolation? Is that working okay? You get that all linearized and good? No. No, what's wrong? What, what doesn't it do? Not the is not good. No. So what it seems like from what we were testing is that when it goes, right, when it comes out the first op amp, it doesn't give us any good signal. So, it so the signal is just all noise. So you've got this follower op amp that's going through some resistor to the emitting diode which then goes up to V plus, right? And this is going V plus, v, oh, why not V minus? V 
want to make sure that the go negative. Okay, so that's conservative then. The so, the pardon me? Diode goes zero, you're right. Yeah. Or did it go minus to minus? So if it, so all right. So that's consistent. And then the the negative here. So then there's the receiving diode, which goes through some resistance. <coughs> some resistance like that, and then this goes to zero or to V minus? Zero, and this goes to V minus. V plus, yes. Oh, but it's reverse biased. That's right, because it's a current source. And so you're saying that the output from here is junk? Yeah. So what did the voltage look like there? So this voltage should have matched this voltage, right? Okay, so then then on the other side there's another matched diode going through resistor to ground and if you put a scope there you should be able to measure the same voltage that you put in here. The problem was that because uh, the positive end of the first amplifier, we were feeding that through a single gen we were feeding it a single generator signal, a sine wave of hundred joules, mm -hmm. and on the up, um, on the to, after the resistor, we got junk, so we didn't really investigate much further. After so resistor here, you got junk. Yeah. yeah. Well, what matters is what comes out here. But if you're getting junk there, that junk is to be transmitted. This will be an extremely nonlinear version of this. Because we were getting a more like a PWM waveform. It's a very, very clipped version of this. Oh, that was okay. Should, is it supposed to look like a PWM waveform? Should it be should it be squared off? It should not be squared. It should, but it should, it'll probably be rounded quite considerably, flattened and rounded. That wasn't the case. It was really proper PWM waveform. And was. It was an inverting, uh, it, was like, it, it was acting like an inverter. So whenever there is a low in the sine wave, it needs to get a high in the PWM. <clears throat> so you need to know what the voltage is here. Because, because if this voltage does not match this voltage, then there's something wrong with the circuit. Yeah. The input was strictly positive, correct? So you DC offset it enough so that it was strictly above the zero volt here. Should have worked. Any other comment about this circuit? Anybody have luck, no luck, debugging comments? What went fully below zero? This, the waveform. So when we just have a signal generator, and we have to direct it to the oscilloscope, it was in a nice sine wave that was you know, halfway above, halfway below zero. But when we took that, that signal and put it into the circuit, it went completely below zero. So could it be the problem that because the signal generator is not working on the isolated power supply, and this circuit is, so when you connect the signal generator to it, the ground comes back? In general, that's what happened. Now, now when you when you hook ground on the signal generator to zero here, which presumably you did, yes. that forces this point to signal generator ground, and the oscilloscope should be then grounded to the same point also. Okay. Well, I have to see it because that. Also, all, all, right. Okay. I found that the value of the resistor you can't the minus is really important. Um, the actual value of it. And uh, I found around 30 k was the value. And somewhere below, like too low or too high, really 
And what happened if it was too low? So, and did you have a capacitor across here as? I tried that and it did nothing. Mm. Interesting. This, this was supposed to be a fairly small capacitor, like 20 picofarads or so. There is, a, there is a, a general rule that if you put a large capacitive load across an op amp, it destabilizes it and causes it to oscillate. And if you get that capacitance up as high as one nanofarad, <clears throat> as high as one nanofarad, it'll generally oscillate. 20 picofarads should be safe in terms of stability of the op amp and, and helps with the, <clears throat> get rid of some of the noise. Is adding a diode for the positive input a good idea? Out here? You mean? This way, forward. So, you're saying that limits it to positive voltages only. It also in, it, it effectively puts a, a 0.7 volt offset into the signal. Uh, I don't think it's necessary from a safety point of view, although, what's the back voltage rating on that diode? the maximum reverse voltage you can put on that diode is I don't happen to have that data sheet with me but I'll bet I can find it that's alright yeah So it says absolute maximum readings, output, reverse voltage, 50 volts. Oh, well, or, oh, that's the output. Input, reverse voltage, 5 volts. Uh-oh. That means that if this point drops below ground, oh, but it can't because you locked it at ground there. So you're safe. You don't need a diode there. If this had been minus 12, and this thing dropped down to minus 12, this thing would be history. This data would be history. Throw it away, start over. Yes? So what added benefit would you get from adding those diodes? This put, if you put a diode here, it could, these diodes are part of the opto. These are all built into the opto isolator, right? These are all, these are coupled by Yeah, so it looks to me like setting this value to zero is a good idea. A 358 can go, can go as low as the negative power supply, but can only go up to positive power supply minus 1.5 volts. Yes? Well, that's always a good idea, too. Yeah, that's usually the last thing you do after you hook up the oscilloscope and test everything. Because that's usually a waste of time. But <clears throat> it's fast to do, but it's usually a waste of time and money. I hope you didn't throw the chips away. Because, yeah. 3.8s are cheap, but opto isolators are expensive. So, so, so if this is too small, then the opt oh, but there's an interesting interaction. If this resistance is small, this resistor has to be small also to get enough current through here to develop enough voltage. So there's an interaction between the size of this resistor and the size of this resistor. You're using 300 ohms here? Or more? Uh, I use 100. 100? Yeah. 50. 50 ohms is on the low side. 350? 
So the maximum linearity for this, according to the data sheet, you get maximum linearity if the current through here is between 0.2 and 20 milliamps. It becomes significant. Where? Here? Okay, 18 is good. I'd say 50 is a little low. If you put a lot of voltage in here, you're going to push that up out of the linear range, perhaps. <coughs> so, so it could, you could push that. But if it's 25 or 30, it won't matter. 50 is the absolute maximum. If you get about 50 milliamps, you blow this out. Well, 50 milliamps for a few seconds anyway. What else? Yeah. So when I was, I, I wanted to DC bias, the input for the amp, which for me is the output of the amp. Yeah. And uh, so I just put, you know, resistor to power, resistor to ground, um, to get it at, at plus six. DC bias at plus six. Yeah. And you and put that I in. I found that um, the, the top quarter of the signal became like uh, it just on the oscilloscope it looked really weird. It just had extremely high frequency noise. And when I lowered the DC bias a little bit, then that went away. So I found that the output of the dip amp above four volts or something just wasn't any good. Yeah. And you had this at plus twelve, and this at minus twelve here. And and you you fed the 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 DC bias into the ref output, yep. the ref input. So there's an input called ref on here, and you can put a voltage divider between zero and plus twelve and hook this up directly onto here to offset the output. Is that what you did? Well, no, my, my ref was to zero. So where did you hook this up? Which non-inverting node? You mean of the diff amp? I see. So you okay? So you did kind of a passive adder to the power supply. Yeah, yeah that's a little crude. If it works, it works. What I would suggest is if if you're not going to use the ref output here or the ref input that you <clears throat> that you put another op amp in here and uh, offset it with a subtractor rather than just a, a passive adder. You can use a passive adder assuming that the output of this guy can drive the adder. How big, what were the resistors in the adder? Oh, well, that should have worked. So you had something like this. You had a uh, 100K here and then 100K to the power uh, to V plus or something. Uh, no, so, so the, the, I had a resistor to the power to plus 12, but I also had a resistor to ref which was zero. You mean like this? Yeah. And like that? Yeah. These shouldn't have affected it at all. It should have been just the output of this guy. Because this has an output of impedance of like ohms, right? And if these are 100K, then they should have, they should have, they should have produced negligible current. And so this voltage should have been the same as, that, as the output of the voltage, even if you just took these out. I guess I don't understand what the rest of the output of this is like This went to zero, right? Yes. So what I wanted to do was then to create a voltage divider that made that changed the DC bias so that it was strictly positive. All right. So ref will do that. Ref is the is the zero line for the op amp. Okay. But if you but if you're gonna if you're gonna modify the output with a with an adder, you have to do something like this, where now the two currents here add. 
you have some current from the plus supply, you have some current from here, and superposition says they're going to add. Now, the, the, the more general way of doing that that's a little cleaner is to put an op amp here hooked up as a diff amp. Unity gain diff amp, where all these are R, all these have the value R, and this goes to some V here. And that subtracts this voltage from here. So we have some minus V here, and that, that uh, makes the output the output of the diff amp plus V here. <clears throat> At least one person told me that the gain of the diff amp was off by a factor of 10. I don't believe it. We, do, we double check it. I give you the oscilloscope K, which was wrong. We double check it. I, I just, I, if, but build this in isolation, not connected to anything else. I don't believe it. I, I, that, this I want to see with my own eyes because the, the, yes, the probe can have the wrong, you know, the probe on the oscilloscope has a divide by 10 setting. The divide by 10 setting is marked times 10, of course, but it's a divide by 10. But the oscilloscope also can be set to think that the probe is a divide by 10. And so the channel setup on the, you go to the channel one setup on the scope, and if you have the, the probe set to times one, then you better make sure that the scope is set to times one. Yes. I don't believe it. I mean, I've used these for years. They always work. And we were definitely getting a signal through that was sinusoidal with like the feet smashing up. It wasn't inverting or anything. You just were missing a factor of 10. And you made sure that the probes were correct and that the channel setting was correct. Yes. Yeah, we definitely checked both. So, you were working on less than 100 ohms to get the amplification you needed from 100 millivolts to what? Well, I got to see it. Uh, you know, that's I. You know, I, I. I believe you're not you're not making it up, but I have no I have no execution model for how it should happen. What else? What other problems with this lab? Has anybody actually hooked it up to their arm yet? Can you have an extra lab day tomorrow? Unfortunately, I mean, I'm willing to, what is tomorrow, Wednesday afternoon? I can be in lab most of the afternoon, and it doesn't look like 3100 uses much of the lab then, but, but uh, our 30, 3140 has the lab on Wednesday afternoon, but it looks like they use about one row. So uh, we, I, mean, I can ask them if that would be possible. I also have hours five to seven. That's right. Akshay has hours five to seven. I haven't sent out the message yet. You sent that to me last night. And I was so insanely busy this morning that um, I can't even remember what I did. I talked to I talked to uh, Rajat's class in in New York Tech campus for an hour, which was entertaining, but didn't get a lecture written. What else? So, what we could do. I generally don't like to change deadlines in the middle of a lab, but if nobody's got it running, if, if nobody's got any data, I, I'd rather you work another week on it than, 
than stay up all night and and and, and uh, do a half-ass job. So, what's the feeling here, folks? You can try tomorrow in the day after, and by then you can you can do. So the software is in a lot of work. Uh, what? The software is in the MATLAB is in a lot of work. The main part is the hardware. So if we get the hardware running by yeah. this, generally this is by mostly a hardware lab, right? This the 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 MATLAB you've mostly already done for lab two, and. So the main thing in the MATLAB is to is to build the appropriate low pass filters. I'm thinking, by the way, next year that this that what we ought to do is is combine the ECG plethysmograph to put in a pulse ox, put in the oxygenation diode, and build a combined instrument over a period of a month or so. Um, you, and if we use non-contact sensors, then you don't have to isolate. Because the sensors themselves are the isolator. Which brings up an interesting couple of final projects. One is non-contact electrodes. I'm willing to fab a circuit board with, with printed electrodes on it. Somebody lays it out or I'll help them lay it out to build electrometer amplifiers on top of, right? You put, uh, and then the students would build, the, would build these or fab them next year, build their own uh, non-contact electrometer. Um, another final project is to do the two plethysmograph, put a, one paper saw put a plethysmograph on pay on finger, another plethysmograph on the toe. You measure this distance, you measure the distance down your body. You've got two distances. You can subtract them. You, you can get the pulse arrival times. You do some signal processing. You get the blood pressure. There's an interesting way to calibrate this. You have the person sitting there. You raise your arm up a certain distance you know the amount your blood pressure falls in your arm because of MGH. And so you can calibrate the change in, in measured blood pressure as you raise and lower your arm. And you can get an absolute measure that way. I think. Another possible, I saw this, oh, this really cool paper. This one is amazing. It was a passive passive voltage sensors that you'd slap onto the skin. There are no wires going to them and no transistors or other active elements in the sensor. All that's in the sensor that's on your skin is a pair of capacitors and resistors. These go off, these are the electrodes, or go off to the electrodes. And then in this circuit is a varactor diode and an inductor. I wondered if anybody was going to ask what that was. A varactor, V A R A C T O R, a varactor diode. Well, First of all, you know from some semiconductor class that every diode is also a capacitor and that its capacitance varies with the reverse voltage. The higher the reverse voltage, the higher the capacitance, right? Because the depletion region gets compressed. Does sound familiar? All right. I see some people sort of looking nauseous when they hear this. But so you. So what that means is that the applied voltage here from the body changes the capacitance of this diode. Not very much. Since uh, typically it takes 20 volts to change this by 50%, it, it, a few millivolts change doesn't change it by much, but it changes it. 
If you tune this to be an RF oscillator, all right, so you have, a, you have an LC, you have an LC tank circuit here, right? You drive this with an RF transformer. You drive it with an RF transformer that's just held near the body. And you can tell how far off these two transformers are from being tuned to one another by the impedance change due to the change in the diode here. So you can make a device that is unpowered. You slap it on the skin. It can stay there indefinitely, say in clothing or wherever. You read it out with a coil some distance away. And you have a pretty non-invasive system. For animals, they're, they're talking about having, putting these under the skin. You put them inside the animal. No batteries, don't have to change the batteries. I knew a guy that was putting transmitters in rattlesnakes. It'd be really nice to not to have to change the batteries. This was a hostile operation. <laughs> this technology is equivalent to an RFID tag. It happens to be an RFID that, that has a, a, a voltage variable element in it and therefore can read voltage really interesting. Just ran across this a couple of days ago while I was doing searches on non-contact uh, voltage measurements. It's called totally passive wireless biopotential measurement utilizes the inductively coupled resonant circuits. Read RFID tags. Very cool. A little scary. You sit down in a chair, you're wired, right? Somebody's got your ECG. You say, who cares? Well, what if ECG, ECG could be used for marketing? What if somebody could tell your state of interest by your heart rate so they know when the advertising is working? So Google is collecting all this data on you and finding out what ads you're interested in by your heart rate. Right? Well, the other way around, I mean, couldn't you just... It's an antenna, right? So it's not just transmitting, it could also receive. Oh, absolutely. If somebody were to send a high powered signal onto your body, you could do Oh, you could do that too. Yes. Ow! Yeah. Yes. Definitely could. What else on Lab 3? Should we go another week on it? And not tell the people who aren't here? Yeah. You okay with that? It's done. <laughs> see, see, <laughs> see if they watch video notes. <laughs> oh, that's so evil. Oh yes, by the way, there is a there is a function in, in MATLAB for doing notch filters. Of course, it's called I I R notch. If you, if you t decide to use a notch filter, the two parameters are omega naught and the bandwidth. This would be 60 hertz, but it's got to be in the right units. And the units for MATLAB always are, in filters, would be the cutoff frequency, FC, in this case 60 hertz, divided by the sample frequency over 2 of the A to D converter. And then the bandwidth and then the bandwidth is going to be omega naught over some constant typically 5 or 10 something like that. <clears throat> Why is Varactor something different? It's just a diode. Or is it it is a diode, but it's been optimized for capacitance change. So the so the, the 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 diode has been fabricated such that it is particularly sensitive to voltage. 
So over, over 20 volts or so, you get a change. I might have that data sheet, actually, on the machine. Let's see if this, oh, it came back up. Yeah, here it is. So this is a, in a SOT23, three millimeters by three millimeters. And the, the, main, the main curve here is that <clears throat> if we look at V in versus capacitance, that we get a, it's a semi-log linear plot. So around one volt input, the slope looks like it's about five, five picofarads per volt, something of the sort. A few picofarads per volt. And it's quite linear, log linear, over a large range. It's not quite clear what it does at low voltage, which is where this would be operating. But obviously, it has to saturate at high voltage. Temperature coefficient. Question. Yeah. Why do we need a very active? Why don't we have just a small capacitor that connects it? Well, a, a capacitor is not going to change capacitance with voltage. But the amount of charge on it will change. Yes, but, but that's not changing the resonant frequency of that because that's a linear change. And what you're, what, the, what you're detecting here is a, a detuning. So you're putting in some fixed frequency out here, some extremely sharp frequency. And what you're asking is, how closely tuned is this circuit to this circuit? And if the tuning is off, the signal drops. So what you do, you're looking at the detuning due to the, to the varactor. And uh, for that, you need a variable capacitance, not only a variable voltage. <coughs> Anything interesting? Are there any other gotchas in here? This is a very short data sheet because it doesn't do very much. So, talked a little bit about last time, I mean, it, it, thinking of final projects again and talking a little bit more about this. Again, any last, any last comments on lab three? We're going to extend it a week? Decided? Can we try it in Thursday if we are not able to do it in Final project gets compressed a week. Or, or lab four, which is, wait a minute, I'm losing track of what's going on here. You're doing EMG now. You're going to do EEG for lab four, right? ECG, yeah, I'm saying not EEG, ECG. That should be a fairly simple change because really what you're doing is moving the electrodes around and recalibrating the, the, the bandpass stuff. How about we drop that to one week? Given, given, given that this is the only thing to, that you're doing in this course, you ought to be spending nine hours a week in the lab. That's the lab assignment. That's all you have to do for the, in this course. Therefore, when you're not in class, class is three hours a week as a four-credit course, you spend nine hours in the lab. And I'd be surprised if you can't do this lab in 18 hours. Or put it differently, 
You can spend all day Saturday in the lab. Or Sunday, depending on your religious preferences. Say again, I'm sorry. Lab party Saturday. I'll bring the Oreos. So, for final, for final project again, I think that this, this, this non-contact sensor thing just fascinates me. I have an unwholesome fascination with it. <clears throat> the idea that you could that you could feed an electrostatic signal. This is a capacitor now. This is non-contact. There's an insulator here, right? There's an insulator here. There's an insulator between here. So you have just a capacitive contact of the skin. And then a at least one group just does a resistor here and a unity gain feedback. So maybe a 10K resistor here. Nothing fancy, just a, just a shield, dri a driven shield using the, the uh, output of the op amp. <clears throat> and the only thing special here is that the op amp has to be extremely low <coughs> input current, input bias current, because after all, there's no DC connection here. So I went looking for, for, for low, input resist, low input current op amps. And this particular one, which was in one of the papers that I linked up, uh, has, a, has an input bias current of 200 femtoamps. That's pretty good. 0.2 nanoamps and fairly low 9 nanovolts per root hertz but the problem is that it's in SOIC only so it's not suitable for whiteboard construction so I went looking for another op amp that was A cheap B P dip C low current but okay. if you have uh, P don't the pin capacitances itself amount to a big? Well, that's a good point, and and you have to worry about that because as soon as you put the input pin into the whiteboard, you've trashed it. So, what you do, and what the, actually this data sheet suggests, amazingly enough, uh, let me see if I can find that little that little application thing here at the end someplace. Air wiring. Here's the op amp. You take the input pin, you bend it up so it doesn't go into the whiteboard. You solder the resistor to it and a feedback capacitor, if any. And that's the connection because it's air has a really good input impedance. About ten to the twelfth ohms or so. So you just bend it up. But for a final project, I don't think that this would be a, a, a suitable way of, of building electrodes. I think what you would have to do is use a solder board. And then on the bottom of the solder board, make a very thin insulation. With a, use the bottom of the solder board for the driven shield, a thin layer of insulation and then some sort of material, maybe copper tape, for an active electrode, and then another thin layer of insulation, maybe saran wrap. But it might be time to just fabricate a board so that when you plug the op amp in here, it is appropriately connected directly through the shield to the active pin, in which case the SOIC maybe the better way to go because you don't have to have through hole stuff the uh, but the nice thing about this op amp is it's 10 feet femtoamp input currents factor of 20 lower than the other one rail to rail output four and a half to 15 volts low offset voltage it's really nice I would guess, however, that the inputs are not protected on this 
with that kind of input resistance, you slide across the floor and touch the input pin and that op amp is history. So you're gonna have to work on these grounded. You're gonna have to be grounded all the time you're working on them until they're in the circuit. Ground straps. <clears throat> it holds your it holds your potential at ground. In in the dry Ithaca weather, if you shuffle across these nice wool floors, you can you can generate maybe 5,000 volts on your body. And it's only a few nanocoulombs of charge, but it's enough to punch out the input stage of these high input resistance op amps. So just a piece of a wire wrap around you doesn't wrap around Well, we can do better than that, but yes. And uh, this, this op amp that was recommended has an, an input stage which is protected. Let me see if I can find the input stage stuff on it. You said recommended? I'm sorry? You said this, this was recommended by who? Oh, by the, by the paper that I was reading on, on, on this. Uh, let's see if I can find the... Yes, there's, there's protection diodes between the inputs to that that allows you to uh, that that absorbs input current. Now, on on the other op amp for this guy, I'm not sure that it has protection diodes. It doesn't mention it, and so a safe thing to do would be to add a low leakage uh, pair of diodes back to back across the inputs low leakage in this case. Oh, on the other side of the 10K resistor though, be over here. Um, and you'd have to make sure that they're low leakage so that you don't wreck the input impedance. So you go through this thing. Let's look at the absolute maximum. So the Differential input voltage is plus or minus the supply voltage. Voltage input at any in input output pin is within 0.3 volts of V plus or V minus. Supply voltage, maximum supply voltage is 16 volts. What was the minimum supply voltage? Four and a half volts. So this would work from a pair of, 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 of three volt coin cells if you wanted to. Okay, in such cases, if we make a Faraday cage on top of the circuit, is that helpful? Well, this is a Faraday cage for the electrode, right? This, this is a Faraday cage. And uh, or a, f a driven shield, and you probably, of course, this driven shield has to go as long and far down this wire as you possibly can. Yes, building a small cage over the top of it may also help. So when you build a Faraday cage, how do you build it? Grounded at one point to the circuit. No, I mean, because the commercial supplies that come up all the time. Yes. Is that for circulation or is that? That's for circulation. So it can be a pure metal sheet. Well, what I would use is a piece of window screen. What? Window screen. You know, the kind you put over the windows, you get aluminum screen or copper screen is better. It turns out you can buy craft grade copper screen at the campus store in little sheets. It's very fine grid copper screen. You can cut it with scissors into the shape you want and and spot solder it to two points on the circuit and it makes a beautiful little Faraday cage. It doesn't have to be solid metal unless you're working at RF frequencies. At 60 Hertz you can have a fair number of holes in it and it'll still work. In fact it can be 50 percent holes and it'll still work. So window screen works fine. When we, when we were doing this in, in, in the lab we just made it out of hardware cloth which is has half centimeter size holes in it and it just worked fine. Let's see what else is important here. 
the input offset voltage is only 150 microvolts, which is pretty low. And furthermore, it doesn't drift with temperature, which means that you can build a circuit and expect it to stay the same output as it warms up. This is slightly worrying that the typical input offset voltage current is oh, 50 femto amps, 50 femto amps, but the max is or the input bias current is 0.01. Sorry, it's 10 uh, femto amps, but the limit is 100. That's horrible. And these are four? Uh, wait a minute. Let's go down and look at note two. That's so crazy that we better look at note two and find out what's going on. Note two. <clears throat> oh, that's useful. All limits are guaranteed by testing or statistical analysis. I'd call those weasel words. That's, that's a non-statement. So this, this is worrisome because it says, yeah, it's pretty likely it's going to be below one, but it could be as high as 100. That's horrible. That's terrible. So maybe we better go back and look at this other one again. Maybe we better go see if it, this one's like five times as expensive. <clears throat> there might be a reason for that. So this is the it's recommended in, it's in, one. Recommend one. It's in SOIC. Uh, ESD tolerance is 2,000 volts for a human body model. So if you discharge your body into it and you're at 2,000 volts, it won't hurt it. <clears throat> Max V in differential is 300 millivolts. After that, the diodes turn on and, and make the and turn off the difference. Supply voltage is 13 volts. All right, nothing, nothing too surprising there. How much are these for again? How much are they? Oh, I think they're around ten dollars, eight dollars. It's doable for a final project. I've got, I've got, I've got budget for this. What? The max is bias current. The input bias current is typical 0.2, and max is one. Oh, so that's a much tighter. Picoamp, yeah, that's a much, that's a much lower limit. Uh, this is well. Let's look at, at at notes four and five. But over the whole temperature range, it's much bigger because they tend to leak at high temperature. Four and five. This parameter is guaranteed. Blah blah blah. Five. Not tested in production. And it's not tested in production. Oh, wonderful. Great. And oh, these are the three volt conditions. This is with V plus equal to three volts. So that's one coin cell. That's what you want to have for a for an integrated sensor is one coin cell. What's the what's the current draw on this? Input input common mode rigid power supply uh, doesn't say what the input current the power supply current is. Supply current. Supply current is about one milliamp. So a coin cell with 100 milliamp hours would run this for 100 hours with no on-off switch. Gain bandwidth product is two and a half me megahertz. That's pretty good. Yes. Well, I think that's what they do. Yeah, you'd have a you'd have a sphere which has this, or you have a capacitor which has the same value as a human body, which is probably around 100 picofarads. And you and you charge up 2,000 volts. You touch it to this thing, and you say, "Okay, does it work now?" And as long as the diodes have enough energy, have enough mass to absorb the energy of the pulse, it'll be okay. So.
You need to be thinking about final projects. It could be advanced pulse ox with, with blood pressure. You could be doing, you could be looking at EEG, non-contact EEG. You could do some other stuff. I'm thinking next year that I ought to make 4760 a prerequisite for this course and bring microcontrollers into it also. What do you think about that? Good idea, bad idea? Or equivalent, right? I don't have microcontroller. I don't have any microcontroller. So it would it would lock uh, lock some people out. Okay, well that's interesting to think about. I'll have to figure that one out. Hmm. Of course, maybe that'd bring in more MAE students into 4760. Maybe. Do you want more students in that class? Hey, this job security, man. <laughs> All right. Let's get out of here.